Honourable Member for Bass. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise this afternoon to give my contribution on the Northwest Maternity Employee Entitlements Bill 2023. Uh, and in doing so, I think at the outset, just want to acknowledge uh, all the incredible women and their families uh, on the Northwest Coast of Tasmania um, and the experiences they've had and also the load that that has applied to not only the Northwest but also to the North. And that anyone that's listening to this or reading through Hansard to acknowledge um, women and their families' experiences all across Tasmania, um, because in having these conversations in the parliament, particularly about matters um, that can be so traumatic, um, can re-raise those issues. And particularly for any interested women on the northwest coast at the moment who are about to birth, um, it's an amazing time, but it can be terrifying in this context. On the matter of the Northwest Maternity Employee Entitlements Bill, um, I've read through the bill and the clause notes, uh, as has been noted by the immediate previous speaker, but also by um, other speakers on this side of the house, um, whether it be the other mums, our leader, our deputy leader, um, Ms O'Byrne that's just spoken, myself, but also as fathers, um, Mr Broad from the Northwest Coast, Dr Broad, sorry, from the Northwest Coast. Um, there are a number of questions that we will enter into, and I know that um, our Shadow Health uh, Minister will enter into those, but having read the clause notes um, and the fact sheet with some outstanding concerns, I think it is important to note that um, it's great that this instrument is before us today. It's great that this work has happened, the transition and it indicates that the transition will occur and, and the provisions for um, the employees um, in this time. But again, I just want to note, why is it that everything is so hard? Why is it that everything takes so long? And why is it that it seems that only under pressure that this government act and take note and then take action? I mean, it just um, boggles the mind that we find ourselves in this place discussing this at this time when really so much should have been considered previously in order that this transition and this work occur. Um, I want to uh, spend a little time... Um, I, I remember back early in the year, and I think it was around February, um, I know our... Shadow Health Minister and our leader had met with some mums on the northwest coast, um, but at that time we had a caucus meeting on the northwest coast, and uh, we had the opportunity to share some of those conversations. And I wanted to take the opportunity today um, just to read in some of those experiences and, and I suppose reflect on why this is happening, why we need to um, make these provisions, and it's important that all entitlements uh, and these provisions are made in a way that is appropriate. And I I just note, and I hadn't. I just note um, the previous comments that you know that that also be done with due regard and due process, like we expect everything to be done, but we are often disappointed with how these things happen, and that you know that thorough consultation should have happened, and that should have included the unions, and it should have been done in a way that ensured that all of these transitions were sound. Um, but uh, as is often the case, these things don't happen. Um, I suppose as a mum myself and others have spoken to this and I acknowledge, I acknowledge that across the chamber um, there have been sort of nodding heads around the time where we say that um, even in a well-prepared, um, well-supported, inverted commas smooth, if you can call, a, an excruciating but um, potentially incredible process, um, joyful process that uh, ends up with a, a child that you know, has entered our lives, even when everything goes right, the process is terrifying. Um, preparing for a first child, there's no rule book, there's no playbook, there's no sort of how this is all going to play out. And so the unknown, um, from the moment that you find out that you're having a child through the process and those unknown moments, and I know Dr Broad talked about a premature birth, but those unknown moments just prior to 
whether you are in labour or not. And then through that process, everything is full of questions. Everything is full of, am I doing it right? Is it going to be okay? Will I have the support I need? What happens now? What do I do? Those questions are so huge. And I cannot imagine for the over a 1,000 women every year that are labouring or due to labour on the northwest coast, that that, that's, that get, has been taken away from them with such uncertainty and such anxiety and, um, and such as an outcome trauma um, for many mums, for their families, um, has, has already been shared for many relationships. Relationships um, between partners, but relationships between mother and child, relationships between father and child, um, relationships, you know, extended relationships where uh, for no fault of an individual or their family, they find themselves in horrific situations. And I suppose what's most important um, from Tasmanian Labor's perspective is that, you know, all mums, no matter where you are, whether you're in a city or in a region, whether you're on the northwest coast or the south, um, they all deserve safe and timely access to maternity services, and they all deserve a certainty uh, and a level of support and security around um, not knowing what's going to happen, but knowing that there's going to be the appropriate support and services available to them. And so at that moment where um, AMA President John Saul declared the services on the northwest coast as a medical emergency, Again, I can only imagine what went through the mind of those mums that were in that phase of the process that it was about to be their experience. Um, and yes, it's great that we're finally moving into this transition, but as I said just a little earlier, why is it that these things take so long and are so hard? And I'm going to read in some people's experiences, but the summary of that is that um, the, the minister at the time, the Premier of Tasmania, a northwest coaster himself, um, you know, how is it that a father isn't already spurred into action, understanding the services that are being offered and understanding what should be expected, that despite um, a group on the northwest coast coming together to support each other, but then in that process finding out all of this common thread of stories and this common thread of trauma and then going to the point of vulnerably sharing that, not just through correspondence or through media, but in face-to-face -face meetings, at every step of the way feeling like they were being fobbed off and not heard. Like, it's just unbelievable that that would be the experience of any community, of any subset of our community, but particularly of the preciousness of mums about to give birth. And so um, we trust that the commitment made to this point and this transition that is occurring, that it occurs in the most timely way possible and the smoothest way possible because, um, again, I, I, I am often gobsmacked in this place at the things that come out of the mouths of um, this government and the things that this government say that they believe to be defensively appropriate, that... Um, we have the, the Deputy Premier, a former health minister himself and a, and a father, um, on the record saying that, um, you know, in our time, nearly nine years of government, as though that's a, a thing to be proud of, you know, we've transformed models of care. Well, when you've got, you've got families sharing and women sharing their experience with the trauma associated with it, to come out and sort of... Um, inappropriately or, you know, people call it tone deaf, say that everything's OK and we're proud of what we've done, I think is just really um, pre-traumatising for people in a, in a moment where they're questioning, you know, have I been... Has, has this been something that I've done to cause this, to have this experience? Am I doing something wrong because of my connection or my attachment with my child? You know, with all these questions going on, that someone would say that. And then further he says... Um, there are further steps to be taken. Acknowledgement, great, but they won't be rushed. And my words here, of course we don't want people to rush things to the point that they're no better or that things are worse, but to defend and protect your territory by saying we're not going to rush when there is an absolute urgent need for response really is um, not what 
the women of the North West Coast were needing or expecting. There's been review after review. So none of this should have been a surprise. None of this should have come um, without uh, time to consider and prepare. But review after review has found that this Liberal government has failed to provide and fund integrated women-centred approaches to maternity care for new parents. And, and there's been ongoing issues with staff shortages and under-resourcing. And that has been you know, unaddressed by this government for a really long time. And when it was raised by the AMA, um, you know, that shouldn't have been a surprise and that the health minister at the time, the premier, um, should have already known and already been in action. Um, and I get in trouble for being parochial, but I'm going to say this, and I've said this once before about the Premier, but when he is a North West Coaster himself at that point, you know, that should be just front of mind, the things that are in your own community that you're hearing with. If you are connected and understand the concerns and the needs of your community, then you must act as a priority. Yes, we have to act in the best interests of Tasmania, absolutely committed to that 100%, but we have an acute awareness, or we should have an acute awareness if we are connected to our communities about what's happening in our past. Um, and no one would ever um, feel negatively towards someone when there was a real concern in the community for their local member to act with priority in that area. And so that, that also just doesn't make sense to me um, that that hasn't happened. We knew the services, they knew the services had been stressed. Um, they knew that there was a lot of pressure. If they had been listening, um, they would have heard and understood that to be true. Now, um, what I'm not surprised with is that when this government do eventually find out and um, acknowledge issues are occurring and then they do eventually act, it's so often only under pressure. It's so often only as a result of, in this case, it was the women themselves of the North West Coast through the media and other means that raised these issues and then with the support of our North West Coasters, um, of Dr Broad and particularly of our Shadow Minister, Anita Dow, who supported these women to share their voice. And I am just going to um, make a juncture here and say that this happens all the time. So just this morning, um, in question time, our Shadow Health Minister um, again, had a similar situation. And I, and I just raise this to demonstrate, as I often believe, what's true in one situation is true of all. Um, what's true at one level is true of all. That this is not, and unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident of, um, of overlooking an issue. That just six days ago, the now Health Minister, and I want to acknowledge that this Minister has not been the Health Minister for very long, so these existing and outstanding issues on the North West Coast are new to his portfolio responsibilities. However, just six days ago, this is an example of the response of this government, this current Health Minister um, attempted to tear shreds off our Shadow Health Minister and our side of the House for proposing a review into the health services, uh, in particular the emergency department of the LGH. Just six days ago, he called our call for a review a disgrace. He called it an attempt to undermine the health service. He called it um, an attempt to raise fear and anxiety into the people of Tasmania. And then, magically, just because there was pressure, just because the things were being raised politically and through the media, all of a sudden, oh no, the review's a good idea. And that's just a, it's an example where time on time again, things are raised through the community, supported by this side of the house, and only when it gets so excruciatingly uncomfortable do they act. But in the circumstances of these women on the northwest coast, um, who have been so beautifully supported um, by Tegan Murphy, not only did it get to the point where things were so uncomfortable and face-to-face um, -face with the Premier that they, uh, that they felt that action was being taken, but not even in meetings with the Premier did they, um, were they able to see action. And it just it doesn't make sense. And I want to read um, the experience of uh, 
these women that met with the Premier. There were five, five mums that met with the Premier. Um, Tegan Murphy, uh, along with her colleague, set up the Facebook support group on the North West Coast for Women. It was through that Facebook support group that they uh, garnered all these stories uh, and this thread of consistency in the experiences of women on the North West Coast. And she led a delegation of five mums to meet with the Premier, who then was the Health Minister. I think it's really disappointing um, when I learnt of this meeting that clearly emotions were high and, and she says herself that emotions were really high. Um, but after a while in this meeting, I could tell that um, the, the, the Premier, he just seemed like he, he didn't really care. And so she asked him directly, what are you bringing to us? And, I, and as I would understand at that time, you know, there'd been so much information shared and there was so much to be known about this that this wasn't a new conversation, it wasn't a first conversation. And she said, what are you bringing to us? She said he had nothing, nothing at all. Yes, he apologised and he listened, but he was looking down and around the room. He said he'd get back to me with everything that I threw at him. It wasn't the time to get back to someone. It was the time for action. The time for action had well passed. This was sort of like, you know, we were having some of these early conversations uh, in February. I know there were reports that came out at the end of the year before. This was in April this year. Um, and, and Tegan felt that the meeting was really just a token gesture. And for these women that were representing other women, um, that, you know, a collection of women that are representing the thousand women that are birthing every year on the northwest coast, they just felt like the Premier couldn't care less, that he wasn't interested. And that just has to be, and I could only imagine that that's re-traumatising for women being vulnerable and sharing their story and trying to stand up for others. When you're in an experience where you're trying to advocate and get an outcome for others, you feel a responsibility for that. You feel a weight for everyone else's trauma and everyone else's experiences. And to be in a meeting with the Premier, the, the Minister for Health, and feel like he didn't care, wasn't interested, it, that, that's a weighty responsibility then to have to go back and share with your group. Um, there were tears at the meeting. You know, they were, they were feeling like they were reliving their trauma. And, and the other thing that was important, that there's been a lot said today about the emotional trauma, the physical trauma, the, the harms and the injuries and the hurt that has happened through this. But as a, as a response to this meeting, they also started to share, you know, the financial traumas, the responsibilities that they took up for themselves, their, their babies and their families, um, to support themselves in their mental state, so whether it's the costs of mental health, whether it's the cost of um, support for some of the physical damages experienced through their time in the hospital, um, and so that that's you know that's that's overwhelming and it's also um, difficult. And I know that former speakers talked about um, some instances where women and in their family structures didn't survive the process in terms of their relationships. And I, and I know that um, for some women, their connection to their child through the trauma, and again, even in a, in a inverted commas, there is no perfect and there is no normal, but in, a, in a, a process that seems to go seemingly smoothly, you know, post birth, the potential of uh, depression at that time that leads to a lack of connection, a lack of being able to feed, um, is so possible, but when you go through a process with so much involved in it, that there were women sharing their stories of that um, post-birth post -birth depression and not being able to connect with their um, with their babies, and that's that's taking away such a, a special time for women that women and families and dads, you know that not being able to connect with your child raises questions about who you are, it raises questions in yourself, and you're often awake and you're often completely fatigued and just exhausted. And so those questions roll on on repeat um, and undermine any confidence that you have at the time, the tiny amount of confidence that you have left um, is taken away from you. And I just want to speak in some of the words of Amy McLaughlin from the North West Coast, because she spoke about it um, in a way that was really brave. And I think in a way that um, when people st share their stories, when women share their birthing stories, and particularly in this support group on the northwest coast, um, they give permission to others to 
uh, release that internal guilt because they realise perhaps they're not the only one experiencing it. Amy said um, for the first month of her daughter's life, Macy, she didn't want to have anything to do with her. You know, 11 months later, she felt, you know, she hadn't received any help. There was no support provided to her. There were um, two free phone sessions with a psychologist, but the psychologist was based in Sydney off the end of a phone. And the psychologist in those two sessions identified that Amy had PTSD, but then said, and that's, you know, that's massive because there's ongoing support needed for that, but then said to her, but I can't do anything about it because you're not here. So that just makes it all harder. She said that she's been to doctors, you know, every couple of months to get referrals, but gets nothing, she says, and, and I love this about them, but if she didn't have a husband, Brady, um, and this is a little unparliamentary, but it's exactly what she said, and I think it's true for her, and I completely get it. But she said, if I didn't have my husband, Brady, I'd be screwed, to be honest. And that's, and that's the level of, you know, whether you then come into challenges with your mental health and how that spirals. There are so many tragic ends to those circumstances. So that Brady has been there to support Amy has been really important. And the thing about this is we talk about the northwest and the services up there and you think about the top of the northwest and and you know maybe as a string of all those little towns it doesn't feel so isolated but Amy was living in Rosebury at the time um, she was sent to Burnie to be induced and she when she when she got there and they started the induction they didn't have enough staff on the day after, she was having her contractions on and off, and around midnight, her waters broke, and the contractions were instantly two to three minutes, just like bang. And that's scary, right? You don't know what's going on in this first birthing process. She was in labour for 10 hours, pushing the whole time, and that was before the midwife realised the baby was stuck. And I think through all of these women's stories, what's important is everyone recognises that it's not the individuals here in these services um, that anyone has concern with. It's that they're overpressured, understaffed, under-resourced, and it's not fair. And I know that the unions at this time were coming out quite strongly saying it's not fair for the people that are serving, uh, that are providing these services to be given this level of responsibility in such an understaffed and under-resourced system. But after 10, year, uh, 10 hours of labour, she's so exhausted, she's literally falling asleep. So Brady had to step up and make um, decisions around the birthing. And as a result, there were complications with the birth. Uh, and Macy uh, was born with ner nerve damage down the left side of her body. When she was born, when they first went to their physio session, she only had 10% usage of her shoulder. Four weeks after the birth, Amy discovered she had sepsis. Then her doctor at the time pulled a blood test from the result from the day that she was discharged from hospital and they could see that the white blood counts were um, elevated and at that time it should have been recognised and that she shouldn't have been discharged. The, the reason why Amy shares her story is that um, for her, what should have been a, a, you know, a difficult but joyful time, she describes as the most traumatic experience of her life. And that she says that no one should go through what she went through. And that's why these women are, that's why these women are speaking up. That's why they're supporting each other. And so I think um, this is all a focus on the northwest coast. And this is something that has been known for a long time. This government didn't act in a way that respected the needs of women and families on the northwest coast. But it's also added a load to the Launceston General Hospital because there were so many times when the services on the northwest coast were bypassed and people sent to Launceston or Hobart. And you're away from family, you're away from community, you're away from that post-birth support. Uh, and so it's added a load to the Launceston General Hospital, but it's also added a load on the northwest coast and locally on mental health services. It's added a load um, because of these experiences and the challenges faced then on the support that happens, you know, in those early months, weeks, months, year of a baby's life in terms of um, the CHAP services and the CAM services. Um, and, and I know in my own experience... Um, that 
it can be that those first hours, those first weeks, those first months where, you know, so much focus is on that birthing process and then there's the, the, the actual daily, daily after that process. And without the support of CHAPS or without the support of CAMS, um, that again is another process that can be just so traumatising. And so, you know, we've heard recently about the closure of beds for the mother and baby beds down in Hobart um, and the government's, you know, quasi-commitments to provide public services there. But, you know, when you lose eight beds and at best they've provi you know, provided, I think it's two, possibly three, depending on how or when you count them. But we know that across the state we need ten of those beds. So this instrument, this this afternoon, is about the North West, but really it's an indication of how this government um, tries to hide from, kick the can down the road on and not deal with issues. It's a indication of uh, what happens in the greater health service, in maternity services across the state, in support for um, mums and families and bubs um, post-birth, and then, you know, support for the, the outcomes of these systems and then the mental health support needed. There, it's a mess. There's a mess across the state in these collection of services and what this um, does today is potentially provide a smooth transition for those people that elect to have the transition um, uh, in this service and the, and the staff that do that. Um, and we've got a number of questions about that. But, you know, it doesn't seem that anything goes smoothly for this government. And so we would hope that um, although it appears there hasn't been the appropriate level of consultation on this, we would hope that this um, employee entitlements bill does progress smoothly. We hope that the, um, the people in these roles are supported once they're transitioned, that the service is established with the right resources and the right people, um, and that for the women of the North West Coast, uh, this chapter will eventually come to a close where there is just an inevitability about the trauma with birthing because all women across Tasmania and particularly on the northwest coast deserve to have the best possible experience no matter the circumstances and to trust that it's safe, to trust that it's timely and to trust that it's there for them. What I want to do this afternoon is shout out to Tegan, to shout out to those women that started that group, that unearthed the commonality of these stories, that put the pieces together and that were brave and courageous and vulnerable and shared those stories and that were relentless and didn't give up and that sought the support, whether it be through correspondence or media or engagement with the Tasmanian Labor Party, to get the support and the acknowledgement that they deserves and needed for themselves but also for future mums. Um, so uh, I'm happy that I've had the opportunity to speak to this this afternoon. I'm happy that I've had the opportunity to share in some of those stories, but I am adamant that Tasmanian Labor, our Shadow Health Minister, um, all of us collectively as a team, continue to ensure that this does happen. What you say you will do, that you will do, that these services are established, that this transition does happen smoothly and all the elements of these entitlements uh, transition to those employees that want to transition and that they're supported to have a great career so that they can support mums to have great births because that's what's deserving.